Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for Long-Term Care in California, what it is and who pays for it. I'm Calvin Hu, coordinator at FCA and your host. For four decades, FCA has been working across the Bay Area and the nation to improve the well-being of family caregivers. We offer support through consultations, classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. If you'd like to learn more about us or access our online resource center, FCA Care Journey, please visit caregiver.org. Now for some quick housekeeping. During the webinar, your phones or mics are going to be muted. If you have any questions, you can ask them by using the chat style question box on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. If you do have to leave early, we archive all our webinars and they can be viewed later on at caregiver.org. Finally, we're going to be asking you to give a little bit of feedback mm -hmm. after the webinar ends, and we use this to help shape future education programs. So I'd like to thank you all in advance for filling those out. Today, I'd like to welcome our guest, Tony Chikatel. Tony is from Cleveland, Ohio, and is a graduate of the Ohio State University College of Law and the University of California School of Public Policy. For the first three years of his practice, he worked in Las Vegas, representing people in mental health facilities. After moving to San Diego, Tony spent six years as a staff attorney for a program providing free legal services to San Diego County residents aged 16 and older. His primary role was as the lead attorney for the agency's Nursing Home Rights Enforcement Project. For the past 13 years, Tony has worked as a staff attorney for California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform in San Francisco. He's taught elder law and policy courses in various Bay Area universities and has also written a number of publications regarding the rights of long-term care consumers, conservatorships, and healthcare decision-making. In 2006, Tony was awarded a California Lawyer Magazine Attorney of the Year Award for his work in elder law and nursing homes. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest, I'd like to turn things over to Tony. Hey, thanks, Calvin. Uh, I guess we're in the afternoon, or no, still morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, webinars are really tough, I got to admit. Um, it's me basically sitting in my office talking to myself for an hour not knowing if you're falling asleep, not knowing if you're engaged at all, not feeling the energy of the, the, the flow, the give and take. I like to do public speaking um, in particular because I think there's a lot of shared energy, shared information, but in the webinar, that's just all missing. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to be honest with you. But anyway, I'll do my best. I've done, I've done many webinars. Um, let me tell you a little bit about California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform first. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in San Francisco. We also have an office in, law, in the Los Angeles area in South Pasadena. We have about 12 staff people. Uh, we do statewide advocacy for long-term care consumers, generally nursing home and assisted living residents. And uh, we've been around since 1983. And we generally do, we do lots of things, <clears throat> but our they all sort of fall into three general categories. One, we deal a lot with Medi-Cal for long-term care in particular. So the issues of qualifying for Medi-Cal coverage to pay for nursing home care, um, the issues of share of costs, so like co-payment issues, and then um, Medi-Cal has a unique feature, somewhat unique feature called the state recovery so that when you pass away, if you were a Medi-Cal beneficiary, there's a chance that your estate will get a bill for the amount of benefits that were paid on your behalf. So it's not a true welfare program. It's more like a loan in some regards. And when you die, the state will come calling, potentially, um, although there's been some reform in the laws, uh, largely due to some work by Canner um, to limit the estate recovery. But anyway, we deal with those Medi-Cal issues frequently. Another issue that we, or another category for our, our advocacy is in uh, lawyer referrals. We have a lawyer referral service for estate planning, and a lot of times that's related to the Medi-Cal issues, but also, um, you know, general broad issues of who gets my estate when I die. So the estate planning attorneys on our panel are really good, and then we have another panel for personal injury cases, um, generally elder and dependent adult abuse cases. So the attorneys on that panel are experts on prosecuting civil cases for elder independent adult abuse, usually against a facility like an assisted living facility or nursing home. Uh, so we do a lot of referrals through that panel as well. And then the third thing that we do, which I think is 
the, the most of what we do is guiding consumers or the family members of, of long-term care consumers. Uh, most of our stuff is related to a facility not doing a very good job and somebody complaining about it, either the resident or the resident's family member. So we get a lot of calls about bad care. Um, so consequently, I'm, I, uh, you know, I can't help it. I'm, I'm pretty biased against long-term care facilities because I only ever hear stories of bad care. I mean, I, I do sometimes hear some good stories, but it's really like pulling teeth. Um, nobody's really motivated to call me to tell me that they're having a good experience. It's all about bad experiences. Um, and the other thing that we hear a lot about is, uh, and I had a call about this this morning, family fights. Uh, so some family member starts to have cognitive impairments, it's usually cognitive impairments, not physical impairments, that lead to some vacuum in decision-making authority. And family members fight over who should ultimately make decisions about this person. Um, I tell you, they're, they're my least favorite kinds of issues because I just feel like it's very rare that any side ever feels like they won, that justice was done. They, they, they fight and sometimes they compromise, but there's a lot of ill will and bad feelings and it's, those are just really rough calls, but very common, unfortunately. So that's kind of what Canner does. Me, uh, Calvin talked about my background. I'm, I'm from Cleveland. Uh, as soon as I got out of law school, I got the hell out of Ohio. I moved to California, which to me is still representative of paradise. I, I love it here. Um, very happy with, with the work that I do. I think it's pretty important. Makes me feel like I'm contributing. Um, what I, what I've mostly focused on here at Canner are a couple issues. Calvin mentioned most of it. I do, uh, obviously I deal with long-term care consumer rights. Um, I consider myself a civil rights attorney. I deal a lot with conservatorships capacity to make decisions. So cognitive impairment issues, dementia care, um, and particularly decision-making authority. I also deal a lot, fairly, uh, fairly, fairly decent amount of um, end-of-life care cases as well. Okay, uh, next slide, Calvin, please. Which I think is my kids. This is um, a very recent picture. I think I took this just maybe four weeks ago or so. Um, I have twin boys who are in the middle there on the right, and then my daughter, Zadie, she's four. She's on the left. My boys are seven years old, and I, I, I you know, I consider myself a caregiver. I'm providing care all the time to these guys. And they keep me pretty busy. All right, the the next couple of slides are real, just sort of basic, fundamental things that you might or might not want to know about long-term care. Maybe some of you already know all this stuff. But I kind of wanted to frame this and and develop a couple of themes before we start launching into actual kind you know places where long-term care happens um so bear with me real quickly what is long-term care it's it's lots of things is the short answer um it's you know helping people um, this is a definition from a textbook um a geriatric uh course textbook uh, and so it's a very sort of academic sounding definitions um but I kind of just wanted you to see what what people, if they're forced to define what long-term care is, here it is. And you'll see my um, editor's note there at the bottom on the last bullet point with the goal to maximize independence. And there, here comes my bias. And I say, really? Because a lot of times maximizing independence is different from doing the job in the quickest way possible. And this is this comes up a lot of times. I see it in institutional care settings where it's just easier to do things for people than to work with them so that they can do it themselves. Um, particularly if you feel like there's no long-term therapeutic potential to regain ability, it, I think a lot of times <clears throat> care providers are tempted or don't really think twice to just to cut corners and 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 do the things for the for the care recipient themselves. For instance, um, you know, I would like to, well, this is sort of an extreme example, but um, in nursing homes, you see this a lot where people are, are encouraged to start wearing incontinence briefs or use a, a bedside commode or a bedpan rather than get up and walk to the bathroom, sit down on the toilet and get back up and walk back to wherever they were before sitting or lying in bed. 
because that takes a long time in some cases to help somebody get up and walk across the room and set them down on the toilet and then get them back up. Um, but that's, that's, that, this definitely is a significant portion of the long-term care definition, I think, about maximizing independence or at least maintaining, in some cases, independence. Um, again, this is just more about what's long-term care, what differenti differentiates long-term care. And I like to remind people all the time, we all need care. Um, I need, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't make my own clothing. So I rely on other people to make clothes and I buy them. We exchange, I exchange money for, for clothes. I'm not too good at cooking. I'm not too good at feeding myself either. So I oftentimes rely on others to prepare my meals. Um, there's division of labor issues, you know, in, in the household. We just rely on, we're interdependent all, and that's what makes us human in so many wonderful ways. Um, but what's different here is, is, you know, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure about making my clothes, but I, I could make my food if I needed to. It, it could get done. It's just I've been able to fortunately focus on other, on other um, things and, and have other people prepare the meals. Um, but in these cases, we're talking about people who really couldn't do, do it independently, even if they had to, even if there was, um, if there was no one there to provide these services for them. So it's, they, they, they really must have these services in order to survive. And um, the reason I'm bringing all this up about what long-term care is and what it, maybe what it's not is because I think fundamentally as a culture, as a society, we don't recognize long-term care when it's, when it's being provided. Even care providers don't, I think, I, I would guess that 40, you know, up to 40, 50% of all long-term care providers in the United States wouldn't even self-identify as caregivers because they're just doing what sort of comes natural. My family member needs help. I'm providing the help. It doesn't seem that significant, but they are providing help. And so they don't think of themselves as playing this formal role, but, but they are. And it's, it's, um, it makes a major difference um, nationally. Okay. Next slide, Calvin. This is real important. This is one of my themes and I did a family Caregiver Alliance event, I spoke at one um, about two weeks ago, and this theme um, generated some, some really interesting and I think helpful discussion. Um, one of my themes is that <clears throat> all things being equal, which is rarely the case, but just hypothetically, all things being equal, um, care that's provided by family members is generally better care than what's provided by professionals. Even though the professionals are being paid and, and you would hope that being a professional would, would bring with it a lot of skills and expertise and education and training and all that stuff. <clears throat> Why do I say that? And this is, again, this is some bias. Um, taking care of somebody is different from caring about them. And to me, the best care usually comes from when you care about somebody, when you care about what happens to them when you're not there. Uh, and that's that's where, unfortunately, in, in my experience, a lot of times the professional caregiving can break down. And it's not so much the caregivers themselves. In my world, it's the structure in which the professional caregivers are asked to to provide their care. So it's usually, <clears throat> excuse me, more corporate management kinds of decisions that sort of hamstring the professional caregivers into providing care in a certain way, as opposed to any ability or inability of the caregivers themselves inherently. Um, so anyway, this is, I think, a really important thing to keep in mind at all times whenever we're talking about long-term care is that real good long-term care is usually marked by the fact that the caregiver cares about the care recipient and not just, you know, they're checking boxes. Uh, this is the list of functions I must perform today and I check them off and, and my job is done. Um, this is really more about quality of life. Okay, next slide. I'm getting on a soapbox here a little bit. So there's all sorts of things that fall in the long-term care services. Um, in the sort of professional or academic world, they'll be divided into certain kinds of activities. The ADLs are your activities of daily living. The IADLs are the instrumental activities of daily living. And ADLs are more about the sort of real basic human needs, um, more biological, eating, toiletting, um, be, being dressed and sheltered, 
those kinds of things. And the IADLs is more of the, um, sort of like the, the bureaucratic concerns of human beings to, to move about the world, to, to manage finances and relationships and, and just to be able to, to interact with one another. Okay, next slide. So here, here's where we start talking about long-term care uh, in terms of where it's being provided and, and, and so the, the, the environment and the, the types of things that are provided. Uh, and I've divided it into two categories. The first category is at home and the other category is not at home. And generally speaking, when we do a long-term care continuum, we start off with on one end, the person is con completely independent. They don't need long-term care. So they, with you know, just minimum assistance related to what we all need, they're able to provide for food, clothing, health, shelter, and those things. And then on the other end of the continuum, we have somebody who's completely dependent to meet all their biologic, their ADLs and their IADLs. Um, that might be somebody in a persistent vegetative state, for example, who, who, who really can't move voluntarily, who can't communicate, um, and we don't have any evidence that there's much uh, cognitive functioning at all. So they're, they're probably not receiving a lot of information as well. And for those people in that continuum, they're going to require significant services, and it's probably going to be uh, it's, it's more, much more likely to be in an institutional setting. So we start off with in-home on one side of the continuum usually, and on the other end of the continuum is something that's significantly institutional, like a hospital setting. So we're moving sort of, I, I kind of envision it from left to right. We start off with informal at-home care, and I'll go into each one of these, and then we're moving into more formal, which is paid. Formal means, in my world, paid. And then adult day, um, which I think serves a, a, a really helpful function, that adult day is typically not provided in the home, it's provided at a center, but the idea is these services being provided at the center enable the care recipient to stay at home the majority of the time. So they, they come from home to the adult day center, they're there for a few hours or maybe a significant number of hours, but then they return back to the home during the course of the day. Um, so adult day is not usually provided at the home, but it enables the, the resident to stay at home. So it's an at-home service generally. And then, then you get into moving somebody out of the home. And usually we start um, assisted living and then we move to nursing homes and hospitals, more institutional-like settings. Calvin, did you have a question? Um, no. Okay. Next slide, please. So here we'll talk about informal at home. And um, another theme that I want to talk a little bit about is is what I wrote down is money, money, money. There's, and, and if I miss anything related to how you pay for any of this stuff, let me know. The key for informal at home care is it's not paid for. Um, that's why it's informal. And this is, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody who's thought about it. This is the vast majority of, of the kind of long-term care that happens in this country. Um, generally family members or friends uh, pick this stuff up. Um, you know, right now, my father-in-law has—he's 86 years old and has some modest care needs, and he's still living at home pretty much independently. But we have to, you know, provide certain chores for him um, and other kinds of minimal services. That's informal long-term care. I think that would qualify, and that's the way most most of this works in America. Um, the, the, what we got to worry about though in, in this case is when the demands becoming increasingly complex and intense that the caregivers um, are able to to provide enough care or um, or you know pro provide their own self-maintenance um, to make sure that they're able to provide good care by first of all taking good care of themselves and I know that that's a something that the Family Caregiver Alliance really focuses on on some of their materials that you can get on their website. Okay, next slide. So then sort of moving on the continuum, we're still at home, but now we've outsourced some of the care, or maybe not even necessarily outsourced it. 
uh, maybe the, the former informal care provider, family member, is now being paid for their services. And that, that happens, that's a very common arrangement as well. Uh, the care recipient could enter into a contract with the family member, sometimes written, just sometimes verbal, uh, that says, hey, this is what you're going to do for me and this is what I'm going to do for you. You'll, you'll pay me this amount. And usually um, there, there can be some estate planning advantages to that kind of arrangement. Um, or it may be just if there's a lot of siblings and they're concerned about either side taking advantage of one another, they may want to reduce their relationship to some sort of written contract so all the parameters are set. Um, anyway, so family members can be formal caregivers as well. Um, but normally I think what people think of as formal caregivers is someone who's who's not a family member or friend, who's who's just a professional caregiver. This is their job, this is what they do, and they move from client to client as needed, and um, they're brought in the home. And um, you know the level of care they provide can be quite variable. They could do just modest tour provision, or they could be providing real, you know, roll up your sleeves kind of care, you know, toileting and bathing and and those things um, that are uh, oftentimes done in, in other care settings, associated with other care settings like nursing homes or assisted living facilities. And in terms of payment, um, Medicare pays for in-home care usually post-hospitalization. It's, it's very rare. This is a very modest source of, of formal caregiving provision. Um, Medicare will pay only for a very limited amount of time. It's got to be associated usually with home health. It's led by a nurse, um, but you can get some short provision um, and personal care services for maybe a week or uh, two weeks, I think, would be quite a bit for Medicare post-hospitalization. Um, it's usually private pay. It covers formal caregiving in the home. Um, there is a, a program uh, if you go to the next slide, Calvin, that um, there's a couple of sort of government benefit programs for formal in-home care. Uh, the main one is in-home supportive services. That's IHSS on the slide, in-home supportive services. The key is you've got to be Medi-Cal eligible, and then the care recipient is assessed by an IHSS agency worker, and they will come up with some number of hours that in-home supportive services will provide. And that's um, usually handled by each county, and the county will pay for those that number of hours provided by either an outside caregiver who sort of works for, I. they don't work for IHSS, they actually work for the care recipient, but they, they their job is they go from IHSS recipient to IHSS recipient. Um, or you can um, have a family member, somebody who was formerly an informal caregiver, now paid for through the IHSS program, or at least partially paid for through the IHSS program. And the county usually pays a pretty low rate, somewhere around minimum wage, I think, or maybe just above minimum wage. Uh, but for somebody, if I'm a family member who's foregone other employment opportunities to provide care to my loved one, IHSS can be a nice boost. They, they were getting no money before, and now they're getting, you know, I don't know, $1,500 a month to provide the care, and that may be the difference that enables them to, to stay as the care provider. Um, there's also the PACE program. I can talk about more about that if there's any questions. And I wanted to let you know also, CANR, that's California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, we have a website with tons of fact sheets, about 75 or so fact sheets on all sorts of issues related to long-term care, including almost all the things I'm talking about today. Um, not so much informal care, but the IHSS program, the VA aid and attendance program. I spoke with someone this morning who, who didn't qualify for VA aid and attendance, but um, we have a fact sheet on that. We have a fact sheet on PACE. Um, I think we have some information related to hiring caregivers, and I know the Family Caregiver Alliance certainly has information on that as well. Okay, next slide, Calvin. I want to be cognizant of the time here. Okay, moving along the continuum adult daycare. This is this is a setting outside of the home, but hopefully enables home care to continue to some extent. Um, there's two, two formal classifications in California. There's adult daycare, 
which has uh, no formal uh, no formal healthcare component to it, and then there's adult day healthcare, which does have a formal healthcare component. What's a formal healthcare component? I think it's just the fact that there's a nurse there who's reg who's regularly there. Maybe not all day long, but at least at some point in each day, the, a nurse comes by and does certain things related to the client's needs. Um, I, I really don't know um, what the ratio is in terms of adult day care facilities versus, not facilities, adult day care centers versus adult day health care centers um, and how much overlap there is. Uh, so the idea is get people out of their home, give them a, make sure they have a hot meal, uh, provide them with um, some activities, some things that are going to keep them engaged. Uh, there's sort of the congregate aspects to it, so there's lots of people there. Um, you're getting socialization, uh, fresh air. There might be some an exercise component here, and some in the adult day healthcare facilities there might be a rehab component to it, so you get some rehab. Um, I used to go to adult day healthcare centers to do legal services, so um, I met clients there. So people who went there four or five days a week, they would sign up to see an attorney. That would be me and I would help them with, with legal, legal issues. So there's people or groups who come in and provide services. I think, you know, there's a discussion of current events. There might be some a musical performance. They might involve the participants in some activities uh, as a group and field trips, things like that. It's, it's a pretty cool concept. Uh, and there is some, there is a uh, governmental program that pays for adult daycare if you qualify. And, and the qualifications, again, are Medi-Cal eligibility. And if you have any questions about Medi-Cal eligibility, I definitely would refer you to our fact sheets on our website as a good first start. And then after reading the fact sheets, if you still have questions, um, feel free to give anybody here at Canner a call. Um, the, the government funding program is called CBAS, Community-Based Adult Services. Um, it took a big hit about 10 years ago when the California uh, state government was lacking a lot of funds uh, due to the recession. But since that time, it's bounced back and some of the funding has, has come back. Okay, next slide, Calvin. So now we're going to the out-of-home placements uh, where funding can, can be a bigger issue because it's more expensive. Because it's, we're talking 24 hours outside of the home uh, much of that time where there's direct caregiving happening or someone's available to provide direct caregiving. Assisted living facilities, I can say, are about mid, what I where I would consider about midway through the long-term care continuum. Uh, the idea is it's a social model, so there's not supposed to be a lot of health care or medical care being provided to the residents. Uh, Department of Social Services monitors assisted living facilities, uh, so it's not a Department of Public Health concern, and the reason being that these are social kinds of facilities where people just get a little observation, supervision, a little bit of assistance with their activities of daily living, but not a significant amount. That was the initial model. This was set up in really about the, the mid-1980s. Since that time, assisted living facilities have really changed a lot of health care and medical care are provided in assisted living facilities. In fact, late last year, there was a California Court of Appeal decision called Hutch in a case called Hutchison, H-U-T-C-H-E-S-O-N for any of you law nerds out there. The Hutchison case um, involved, uh, uh, I don't want to get into that, but there was a, a review by the court of what assisted living facilities are. Are they Social models of care, are they medical models of care? And the court concluded, hey, there's a lot of health care going on here. For purposes of this one legal issue, we're going to treat you as a health care facility. So that was kind of a big deal um, to show that as things evolved, have evolved, the courts are now recognizing that. And so there may be a new legal reality to some extent for assisted living facilities. In California, it's kind of confusing. The assisted living facilities are called RCFEs. That stands for Residential Care Facilities for the Elderly. Again, Residential Care Facilities for the Elderly. Um, there's also adult residential facilities for people, under, generally for people under 65. They're ARFs, Adult Residential Facilities. They're generally for people who have mental health concerns, people with diagnosed with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or Se severe depression would be people who often live in a adult residential facilities. 
The RCF RCFEs are more the classic assisted living. This is an elderly person who has physical or cognitive disabilities that require they to have protective supervision. Um, to sort of further complicate things, the RCFE really has two models in California, but they all fall under this RCFE umbrella. And the two models are the small boarding care home, which is usually a house in a neighborhood that would not be really identifiable as an assisted living facility. <clears throat> uh, again, those are called boarding care homes. And then there's the larger providers of assisted living services that are also RCFEs that could be hundreds of beds or hundreds of rooms uh, that look like apartment buildings, sometimes very fancy apartment buildings with you know, big fountains in the front and um, kind of a you know, swanky dining room where people get dressed up to come. Uh, so there's, there's these two very different models, but they're all licensed and regulated the same uh, as RCFEs. Okay, next slide, Calvin. So I also want to mention room and board. So I talked about board and care. That's what a lot of people call the smaller RCFE models of six beds or fewer, six residents or fewer. I've been hearing more and more about room and board facilities, which are unlicensed. They, they would look like a boarding care home. It's a small, usually single family dwelling, maybe three, four, five bedrooms. And people are living there and they're getting some services. Uh, definitely they're getting meals. That would be the, the board part of the room and board. <clears throat> But sometimes they start to look a little like assisted living facilities. Their residents are getting their medications passed by someone who works in the room and board. They're getting help to and from the toilet. They're getting help with grooming and it starts to look like maybe they ought to have a license. Um, I could go on for several minutes about the concerns about room and boards, but just to put that out there, there of course there would be no um, government benefit to pay for a room and board care other than maybe IHSS if if one of the workers there qualifies or you bring in an outside person to IHSS or, or like a VA aid and attendance program as well. Uh, although I think if you get two people receiving IHSS services in the same room and board then it starts to look like yes this is an R, actually an RCFE and there may be issues with the, from the licensing agency about that. Okay, next slide, please, Calvin. Okay, assisted living paying payments. Um, the vast majority is private pay, meaning you pay out of your pocket the way you do for most services. There is a small, uh, small is not the right word, uh, a government program, the Medi-Cal Assisted Living Waiver Program that will pay for some assisted living care for people who would otherwise be in a nursing home. The idea being that Medi-Cal pays for nursing home care, which we'll talk about in a minute. And they pay a pretty significant rate, usually uh, well in advance of $200 a day. If that person could reasonably be, be cared for in assisted living, uh, it's a lot cheaper. And so Medi-Cal will have a net benefit by paying for that assisted living care that it normally wouldn't pay for because otherwise this person is in a nursing home at let's say $250 a day and on the Medi-Cal assisted living waiver program would pay $80 a day. So it's a, it's a significant savings for the state and it might be a win for the residents as well because nursing homes tend to be more institutional. The assisted living might be more home-like. The care might be a little better. So it's a win-win. State pays less. The resident gets better services or at least a uh, higher quality of life. Um, so that's the idea of the assisted living waiver program. The problem is that the state doesn't pay us a very high rate. A lot of assisted living facilities aren't interested in participating in the program. And right now the state is capped at five, I think it's 5,000 or so slots. And they're all taken and so now there's a, a wait list. There is some legislation to expand the assisted living waiver program. We'll see how it, how it does. I um, also want to mention, this is real important, that SSI, that's Supplemental Security Income, that's paid uh, through the Social Security Administration, it's often associated with Social Security, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, will pay for assisted living care. Um, I'm sort of misstating that. Uh, there is a SSI board and care rate, so if you qualify for SSI, and the board and care rate, it's about $1,100 or so. So if your income is less than $1,100, and your age are disabled, 
the facility has to, the assisted living facility has to accept that board and care rate as payment in full. So even if an assisted living facility charges five, six thousand dollars a month for all the residents, if one of the residents runs out of money and is very low income and qualifies for SSI, the facility has to take that a thousand dollars or so every month as payment in full. So it's not really SSI paying for assisted living care, it's compelling assisted living facilities to provide care at that rate. Um, not too many people know about that, but, but that is the case, and we have, that's covered in one of our fact sheets on our website. And as I mentioned, Department of Social Services regulates and supervises assisted living facilities, and that is their community care licensing division that does that. Okay, oh, next slide please, Calvin. But um, before I get into nursing homes, I also wanna mention that long-term care insurance is a potential payment source for some of this. For in-home care, it, it really depends on the policy. They may pay for in-home care that may require uh, uh, an out-of-home care setting to, before the policy is triggered. So they may, it may pay for assisted living care. It may pay for nursing home care. I typically don't talk much about long-term care insurance policies because very few people have them. And for those who do have them, they're usually so narrow in scope. They'll, you know, there's some cap on the number of days they'll pay for or the, the, the definition of services that, is provide, that are provided under the policy are so narrow that it just doesn't come up much. I, I get maybe one or two long-term care insurance policy calls a year, I would guess, maybe, maybe three. But in the context of what I deal with, that is, is almost non-existent. I get hundreds of calls and emails every year, and very few of them are related to long-term care insurance policies or pe for people who have long-term care insurance policies. Okay, so nursing homes is, you know, an institutional care setting. This is the definition under California law. Here is where you get substantial government benefit involvement. Medicare pays for up to 100 days of a nursing home stay for each benefit period. I'm not gonna get into benefit periods, but but the real in the real world, Medicare would usually pay for about 20 days, you know, two to four weeks, I would say, of care in a nursing home following a hospitalization. You have to have a, a three-day hospital stay to trigger the Medicare benefit. So Medicare is, um, pays for a lot of nursing home care, but they don't pay really in the long run. So if someone's, so what Medicare is interested in paying for is, is rehabilitation. Someone has a catastrophic occurrence or they have some surgery where afterwards they're going to need rehabilitation, they'll pay for that and get the, with the idea of getting the person home and they won't have to pay any more. If it's somebody who's got a chronic progressive condition that's not going to improve and they need a lot of care and they end up in a nursing home, Medicare is not interested in paying for that. And that's where Medi-Cal comes in. Medi-Cal typically pays for what they call custodial care. This is sort of the, the old school model of nursing home care, which is someone needs a lot of help they go to this building and this is where they're gonna be until the end. Uh, that's not what nursing homes are focused on generally anymore. They're, they go where the money is and the money is where Medicare is and that's rehabilitation, short-term stays. So the long-term care provision in nursing homes is actually on the decline. Um, long-term care residents are really disfavored in nursing homes and, and to some extent that's, that's fine. I mean, at least for all sorts of issues for us with discharges and things like that. But, um, Kenner generally supports the idea of you know, focusing more on community-based care settings like assisted living facilities rather than the sort of the institutional model of nursing homes, the hospital-like model of nursing homes. Um, and here we got the Department of Public Health that's very much involved, um, licensing and certification that is the LNC, licensing and certification division. Okay, next slide, Calvin. And I think this is my last substantive slide. Just wanted to mention hospice. Oh, before I get into hospice, I also wanted to mention CCRCs as part of the long-term care continuum. CCRC stands for Continuing Care Retirement Community. And the idea of a continuing care retirement community is having a significant chunk of the continuum in one spot. So it, oftentimes CCRCs are in a real big building or on a campus with multiple buildings <clears throat> with the idea that you can go there as somebody who only needs very basic services, independent living, and if your needs change over time, 
you don't have to move, or at least you don't have to move very far. You stay in the same campus or in the same building or maybe even on the same floor, and you go to the assisted living unit of that CCRC, or they also oftentimes have nursing homes. You go to the nursing home unit if, if you need that kind of care. So that's CCRCs, and um, we have some facts. We have a whole multiple web pages on CCRCs on our website if you want to take a look at that or you have um, concerns about it. So then the hospice is, I don't know why I put this at the end of continuum. It's, it's the end of life continuum. I'm not sure about long-term care continuum, um, but it seems like a sort of a natural place to, to end. Uh, hospice is more of a philosophy as opposed to a care setting. Hospice can occur in all sorts of care settings. It can occur in the home, assisted living, nursing homes. It's, it, it, there, there are some places known as hospice houses. In California, those are usually congregate living health facilities, CLHFs. Um, not too many of those around, um, but that's a, where a lot of times people on hospice uh, with nowhere else to go will go. And uh, Medicare typically pays for hospice. There are some uh, requirements, obviously, about getting the care covered. The big requirement is that a doctor certifies that the Medicare beneficiary has six months or less to live, and then that can trigger the Medicare benefit. But Medicare doesn't necessarily have to pay for hospice. You can go out of pocket to pay for hospice, uh, and Medi-Cal will pay for hospice as well. Um, so I think that's my last substantive slide. Can you advance, Calvin? And there's a picture of my kids when they were really little. And thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions at all right now. And I also want to mention, I'm probably not going to have enough time. Hopefully, I'm not going to have enough time for questions because you'll have a lot of them. Um, but feel free at any time to call me or email me. Uh, that's what I do. That's my job is to, a big part of my job, is to take telephone calls and, and emails from people who have concerns about any of this stuff. Um, my email address is Tony, T-O-N-Y, at canner.org. That's T-O-N-Y at C-A-N-H-R dot O-R-G. Or you can call Canner. The 1-800 the number is on this slide that's showing right now on your screen. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, Tony didn't mention that he was at one of our events for young caregivers. And I'd also asked him to join us for this webinar. And despite being very busy, he really wanted to participate to try and share the information. So we're all very grateful that he could spend, um, spend his time with us. So I'd like to get right into questions because we have a lot of them. First off, perhaps since you just spoke about kind of Canner's policy or philosophy about long-term care, but someone had a question about I guess the pros and cons of senior co-housing options or senior villages as an option for long-term care. Do you have any, any thoughts about that or, or um, any kind of um, advice on that? I do. So on senior villages, <clears throat> all I know is what I've read and I, I haven't read a whole lot. I know that there's, um, there's at least one in Massachusetts that gets a fair amount of publicity and with the idea being that there, there's this co like a cooperative it may be a building, it may be a neighborhood where there's um, lots of people who have care needs that live very close to one another and they share services. So it's a way, I think, to minimize costs and, and maybe to improve quality as well, to have some sort of standard provision of care that's through this cooperative. And I, I unfortunately, I don't know much more about it. I don't know of any models in California, unfortunately. I don't know of any policies in California that promote this uh, or authorize it or regulate it in any way. I know that it's probably going to come up. There's a lot of work in the legislature being done right now to create commissions and blue panel, uh, blue, blue ribbon committees to, to explore how we're going to deal with the significant number of, of aging people in our population in the, in the flat or even decreasing number of people that take care of them in California, and this may come up. So on the villages, I don't know a whole lot. On the shared housing, I, I do know a fair amount. I know that there are, in a lot of communities, there's funding for shared housing programs. The idea being that seniors are often cash poor and house rich to be able to utilize the house in a more meaningful way as a source of, of generating cash. So seniors with rooms 
can rent them out to anybody. It doesn't necessarily have to be a senior that comes into the home and, and vice versa. Sometimes seniors need a place and, and to match um, the, the demand with the supply. So matching a senior who needs housing with someone who has an extra room. And the idea is sometimes the rent can be negotiable based on the services that the person who moves in is going to be able to provide. Uh, so shared housing programs, I, I, I can't think of some place, one place where you could go online and find out all sorts of things about what's available in California. There may be a site like that, uh, but I know for people who don't have a lot of family members uh, available to provide the care that shared housing might be an option. Okay, perfect. Um, and then in terms of payment, I remember you mentioned that the uh, um, the uh, the kind of the welfare program that's that's not exactly that was initially not exactly a welfare program, more of a loan. But we have a, a caregiver who wanted to know about how to protect her assets. It sounds like her person she's taking care of has dementia, which one would imagine it was going to be one of these very kind of costly and difficult, uh, um, difficult things to provide for. So, so uh, is the concern that the caregivers resources might be at stake when the bill comes due from Medi-Cal potentially? Is that yes, the concern? I, yeah, I do believe so. Okay. If I understand that right. Uh, so I would encourage any of you who have concerns about a state recovery, it's the Medi-Cal estate recovery program. And, and actually, there's an in-home supportive services state recovery program on the books. I don't think it's um, ever enforced or actually utilized. Um, there, there's a number of fact sheets. So I encourage you to, to check out our fact sheets about the Medi-Cal program and estate recovery. Generally speaking, the estate recovery program is significantly reduced from where it was a few years ago and is not as, as much of a concern for anybody who's done uh, decent estate planning and is going to have their estate avoid probate upon their death. But one thing for sure is the caregivers are not at all financially liable for any Medi-Cal estate recovery, unless, of course, it's your spouse, uh, but there's a uh, suspension of any estate recovery for Medi-Cal beneficiaries who have a surviving spouse until the surviving spouse passes away. So um, it's only ever the beneficiary's estate that's at risk, and that risk is significantly minimized from where it was a few years ago. But I would encourage you definitely to take a look at our Medi-Cal fact sheet to talk more specifically about estate recovery. And then, and then uh, any other questions you can you can call us about. Perfect. And a question about funding long-term care. Many of the options you mentioned that was the kind of subtext was that they they might be more or less in terms of cost, and and all these things tend to cost money. So for someone who might not be able to be eligible for some of the income assistance programs offered by the state, but who also do not have enough money to maybe purchase a long-term care insurance policy for themselves or, or family, um, which I guess is kind of the middle class, what, what would you recommend in terms of how they might be able to fund long-term care? Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is a really hard one. I, I had a, uh, an email this morning from an attorney down in Bakersfield who has um, a really tough case. He says, I'm, I'm really frustrated by this. Maybe you can help. And the circumstances are kind of just as you've described in your question, Calvin, uh, the, the, the care recipient is in assisted living facility and has been there for about a year. The cost is somewhere around $4,500 a month. So about six, sixty thousand dollars a year. The the care recipient's wife, who's still younger, she's in her late forties, is working and makes you know I would what I would call a probably a, an average or maybe lower middle class kind of salary, and the resources are running out. There there was a savings that's being drawn upon to pay for the assisted living care. What do we do? Because the wife works, they're not. And she she makes a decent amount of money. She's not going to call. He's not going to qualify for any real government benefits in assisted living. Um, so my response: Well, we we wrote an I wrote an article about what happens in assisted living when the money's running out, 
the options are not so great. I talk about the assisted living waiver and SSI and and those kinds of things. Um, but it's it's really hard, and unfortunately, there there are there are multiple times a month where I have a conversation with somebody where I say, uh, unfortunately, you would never want to hope for this, but if it happens, you need to be ready to leverage it. You need a hospitalization. You need the, that care recipient goes to the hospital and 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 gets a qualifying stay for Medicare. They will become very attractive to nursing homes. And once the residents in a nursing home, they've got unfortunately a lot more uh, government program options. They can they can stay when Medicare is up. They can stay if they qualify for Medi-Cal. And um, generally, it's it's easier to qualify for Medi-Cal in a nursing home than it is if you're married. Uh, than it is if you're not in a nursing home setting. Uh, there's different criteria that allow spouses to have more resources that, to qualify the, the ill spouse in the nursing home for, for Medi-Cal coverage. So um, there's no easy answer on that. I, I welcome anybody on this uh, webinar to give me a call and you can give me more details about your specific situation. But generally, I'm, I'm always telling people, don't give up on the in-home care quite yet. You, you consider these different options, adult day, um, the Family Caregiver Alliance can help, I'm sure, with some of the stuff. There's respite care options. Maybe maybe you try to bring in more family members or friends to, to play a more formal role, and, and there may be ways to bring in a mediator to help with those kinds of things. Uh, but but if if you've really tried all those things and they're, or they're just not options, then unfortunately, you're really stuck in and it's it's weird to hope for someone to go to the hospital and and then go to a nursing home, but sometimes that's the only option available. Sure, sure. And then in terms of some of the uh, long-term care options, I think it was the VA aid and assistance programs. Did I get the name right on that one? Aid and attendance. Aid and attendance. Sorry. Would would you be able to just yeah. uh, spend a, a brief moment, just kind of giving a bit of an overview on that program for? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I don't know the program very well, but I know that our website has a really dynamite fact sheet on it that's very popular. It is for wartime vets, so I think you have to have served during a wartime. Um, and I think it covers the vet and the spouse potentially for basically in-home care. Uh, the, there, it is means-tested, so you don't automatically qualify as a wartime vet. You have to be below a certain income threshold which I, I can't remember exactly, 2000 some odd dollars a month maybe in income. And if you're below that, then the, the VA will help pay for in-home care or care wherever you are. So even if you're in an assisted living facility and you qualify for VA aid and attendance, I think it's possible that the person who's paid for through that program comes into the assisted living facility and, and supplements the care that you're already getting. So that's a possibility. And I, I think also that, that covers nursing homes as well. You can get additional care into the facility through the aid and attendance program. But I, any questions on aid and attendance, uh, go to our fact sheet on our website. And okay. if you still have questions after looking at that, then give us a call and, and we'll connect you to someone who knows more about it than I do. Perfect. And then I think we have time for one more question. And this is probably a question that would make your lives potentially easier. And it is, um, what makes for a bad nursing and rehab center? I guess the flip side is how to choose a high quality nursing uh, or rehab center, nursing home rehab center. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I get this question a lot. We have, and it's, there's some information about how to choose and some checklists, how to choose uh, long-term care facilities, assisted living and nursing homes. Uh, and I know Family Caregiver Alliance, I think, has information about how, what to consider when choosing somebody to work in your own home, and, and maybe even examples of arrangements to, to set that relationship formally in a contract. Uh, but how to find a good or bad facility? Uh, well, nothing beats the personal visit. So v visiting a place personally is, is the most important thing to do. You can do all sorts of research online now about regulatory compliance and peer reviews, you know, and, um, Yelp and things like that. They're, it can be sort of helpful. And the government has, um, the federal government and the state government both have pretty good websites where you can get information that would indicate whether a facility is good or bad. There's also a lot of data you can get now about particular parts of facilities performance. You can look at their staffing 
data now. If it's a nursing home, their payroll staffing data is now available through the federal government website, CMS. And that, that those, are, those are a little difficult to, can be a little difficult to navigate. Anybody who's really focused on a tough decision, feel free to give me a call and we can talk about those things. Um, but nothing beats just going in person. And I always recommend if you go in person and you're, you know, you're sort of given the tour, the formal tour of the place, it's always, almost always going to be a Monday through Friday at a you know, prime business hour between 9 and 4 o'clock, let's say. And that's fine. Um, it's, I think it's important to, to, to hear that pitch and to tour the place when it's you know, very fully staffed. But also encourage you to not rely on that alone. You want to go a second time. And you want to go in an evening, maybe a little later at night, or you want to go on a weekend or holiday at a time when the facility might not be so fully staffed. How are things going there? I, I remember I went to a, an Oakland nursing home. This is several years ago. I had been there once before, and, and uh, it was for an issue that was not related to that particular nursing home. So I um, didn't observe anything that was too striking to me. And then I went back six months later, and it was in the evening. It was, I don't know, just maybe like 6, 6.30 at night. I had a conservatorship client there. And I walked in there, it was like tumbleweeds were blowing around and um, people were crying for help and people who weren't even asking for help, but certainly looked like they needed it, were being unattended and I couldn't find anybody anywhere. Um, so that was a much different impression. So you definitely want to visit evenings and weekends. Um, talk to residents. I think it's important. Really take note. T to me, the big issue with caregiving, uh, I mentioned this before, do the staff look like they care about the residents or are they just taking care of them? Are they, when they provide care to somebody, are they involving them? Are they talking with them? Are they using it as an opportunity for engagement or are they just doing things to them? Are they turning them over without telling them what they're doing or how they're going to do it or why they're doing it? Um, I also tell people all the time to look at uh, fingernails, teeth and hair. Those are three really important things to look at that will tell you if you have nothing else to look at, when you do a nursing home visit, look at the resident's fingernails, teeth, and hair. If they are well-groomed and well taken care of, that will show. If they're not, that's usually one of the first places that slips when the facility doesn't have enough staff to do the small details that add up. Are they getting their teeth brushed? Are they getting their fingernails trimmed and cleaned? Is their hair getting done? Uh, so those are just some quick rules of thumb. Again, I would refer you to our um, Fact sheets, I will tell you this, uh, in terms of nursing homes especially, and, and I, I don't want to discourage anybody from considering every option possible because I don't know any of your circumstances personally, um, and I don't know what you've been through or what you're going through and, and how difficult it might be, but just, again, all things being equal, nursing home care is not going to be as good as care that's provided in the home. So it's my way of just sort of counseling you to be, be relatively demanding of the nursing home. If you settle for something that's, that doesn't appear so great, chances are the care is not going to be so great. And I, um, assisted living, there's, uh, I don't get as many horrible calls about, assist, I don't get nearly as many horrible calls about assisted living facilities as I do nursing homes, but there's a lot of variation in the quality of care. So talk to people, maybe the long-term care ombudsman program, they, they will not give you a recommendation about any facility, but I've known the long-term care ombudsman program, and there's one in every county, to tell people that, okay, that's a place you probably want to, that's not a place I would put my mom. Uh, they, you may get information like that, or, or they may tell you it's, it's a wonderful place. I don't think they'll give you, a, again, I don't think they'll give you a formal endorsement or thumbs down on anything because that's not really their job, but a lot of times they are helpful as a source of information about any particular facility. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Tony. That's actually, we're just about running into an hour, five minutes a little late, five minutes ending. So I'd like to thank you all for participating in our webinar presented by um, Tony Chikatel. Um, and again, thanks, Tony, for spending this afternoon with us. He's been pretty busy, very busy actually. So we're very grateful that he was able to, um, to take some time out and, and talk with you all this afternoon. Um, uh, FCA I really appreciate the opportunity, Calvin. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're always happy to have you. This is the second time we've had Tony on. So it's, we felt it was a, 
it was about time to have uh, have him back to to share all this information with um, with you all. So uh, FCA webinars are a free and continuing series. You can find information on our next webinar on our website. We will get this one archived and on our YouTube channel in about two weeks. So you're able to uh, watch it later on if you just need a little bit of refresher. Please, as Tony mentioned, if you have any further questions after reading their factor information sheets on canner.org, you can feel free to call or email Tony. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for joining us, uh, Tony, this afternoon. Um, the webinar is now concluded, and we hope to see you all for the next one. Have a great afternoon.